joining us for the 11th annual McMinnville Short Film Awards. Yay! Woohoo! We made it. I haven't heard any cases of COVID yet, so that's a good sign. You're, I see all your smiling faces. I absolutely love it. I missed all of this in-person interaction. Whether you need to know me or not, my name is PK. Uh, I am a local actor from Portland. Uh, I have done a few other things in town, but Nancy, crazy as she was, actually invited me to be the MC of the event tonight. There's a running joke in my hometown. Uh, this may be hereditary, I'm not sure, we'll find out. But the running joke is that the most dangerous place in the room is between my father and a microphone. So I'm going to do my best to curtail it and keep it to a dull roar, but I wanna be a little bit entertaining and celebrate the filmmakers who put a lot of energy and a lot of work into stuff that we showed here, right? I mean, my gosh. I've been coming to this festival for about six years now, and I remember in the very beginning, it was not even a full day. By the time I got here, it was Jason Rosenblatt was here in those days, it was one full day. Now, four full days of, fe of festival submissions. You guys watched 10 blocks of films. Heck yeah, that was awesome. And and the caliber, and the caliber of projects just keeps getting better. Are we good? Are everything okay? Okay, okay, all right. So, uh, before we get into the individual awards and celebrating all of the winners for tonight, right, I want to recognize a few different individuals. First, the McMinnville Board of Directors. Please, when I say your name, stand up and be recognized. Holly Wagner, Leanne Jones, Leanne Jones, Ray Namoto Robison, Melissa Gregory Rue, Stephen Long, and of course, Nancy and Dan Morrow. Stand on up. All right. Yes. Great job, you guys. Just keeps getting better. In addition to those big, important, bougie board of directors, there's the support team, right? Vanessa Haddock, Heather Older, And Nick Schaefner, make sure that those of us that <laughs> have our names all over the place don't look like fools, even when we try. I'll keep the award show itself short, sweet, to the point. When you winners come up here to get your plaque, please make your way over to the red carpet and step and repeat for official photography taking. Right now, I'm going to introduce my new and good friend, the angry filmmaker, Mr. <laughs> Kelly Baker, your keynote speaker. He's worked on all of these major projects, sound design for Gus Van Sant. He's got three feature, five books, three features, and eight short films. Oh, and, and my gosh, I'll be his avatar. I'll just read his notes right for him. Why, we... You can. <laughs> all right, buddy. I'm going to turn the mic over to Kelly. He's got about 15 minutes of stuff for you. Then we're going to have an intermission where you can ply yourself with more wine, and then we'll recognize all of the individual winners. Kelly. And if anybody wants to grab wine while I'm talking, I'm good with that, because I would like to do it too. Can we, can we take a moment to check out my jacket? All right. Most people don't realize I even own a shirt with a collar. All right. This one. The last time I wore this jacket, I was the keynote speaker at a uh, film festival in Minnesota, and that was 20 years ago. So this jacket doesn't come out much. <sighs> Do what? Don't talk to me because I can't hear. I'm a sound guy, damn it. I'm the sound guy you don't want on set. 
First off, I want to thank everybody for inviting me. Uh, it's been a great festival for me. This is my first time here, and it will not be my last. Right? And you're going to have to get a restraining order. I know. You're going to have to get a restraining order to uh, keep me to stop coming here. All right. Yesterday when I did my workshop in the last couple of days, I've been asking people, it's like, it's a keynote speech. What the fuck do you want me to talk about? Really? I mean, you know, I can come up here and blather all the time, and there's going to be a huge line with the wine thing. And somebody get me one while you're up there. I'm drinking white. Um, anyway. Here's what you're getting because you didn't tell me what to talk about, okay? <laughs> and I'm sorry. About 44 years ago, I started on an adventure. I was 21 years old, and I drove down to Los Angeles to start USC's film school. And I didn't know a soul. My first night in, well, and actually, when I decided to do filmmaking, this was not a real job. And this was not a career. And when I'm telling people I'm moving to Los Angeles to become a filmmaker, oh God, she's got wine. <laughs> yeah. Now I feel important. Anyway, when I was telling people I was going to go to film school and become a filmmaker, they looked at me like I, like I was going to go get a philosophy degree. Like, what the hell are you going to do with that? Right? And it was a long two-day drive to Los Angeles in my 1970 Toyota Land Cruiser with everything that I owned in it. And if you guys know anything about the Toyota Land Cruiser, you know... It is not going to go any faster than 55 miles an hour for a thousand miles. And in fact, you can drive a Land Cruiser off of the Grand Canyon, the cliff, and it is not going to fall any faster than 55 <laughs> miles an hour. So I make it to LA, and the very first night I get down there, I stay with, and I got to get this straight my father's insurance agent's sister and brother. <laughs> and by the time I spend one night there, I still don't know anybody in Los Angeles. But I went to USC, and but when I went to USC at the time, they used to get 500 applicants for 40 slots. And then Star Wars came out and they would get 5,000 applicants for those very same 40 slots. And thank God I'm as old as I was, because I was able to sneak in under the wire. On our first day of film school, everybody goes around the room. You guys have probably experienced this in other film programs. And you tell people what it is you want to do and why you're there. And I'm sitting there, and I'm hearing all of these people talking about Truffaut and Fellini and Goudard and Bergman and how they want to make these artistic statements, and I am so out of my element. And when it got to me, I said, I want to make Hollywood films just like the movies I grew up on. And I was immediately branded a lightweight, and all the faculty kind of looked the other way. It's like, we took him, we've got to deal with him. And I really, really felt like I was in the wrong place. I was a car salesman's kid from Oregon in Los Angeles. But I knew that, one thing I knew was I was not the most creative person in that class. But I knew I could outwork, outwork them all. And so I did. Of the 20 people in my group that started, only two, after two years, went on to direct senior projects. And I was one of them. We had a 50% dropout rate. 50%. Because the faculty wanted to know how badly you wanted to be there. 
And it was an amazing experience because I spent tons of time in screenings and labs. And at the time, we had the coolest people coming down to, co to campus to lecture to us, to talk to us. I got to see Alfred Hitchcock. I got to see Orson Welles, who was huge. <laughs> and it was not pretty. I, I got to have drinks with Sam Peck and Pa, which was fucking scary. And Warren Oates came with him, and it's like, no, you don't want to. Because I took a class on the Western. But I learned so much about film history and film criticism, and I watched foreign films, and I fell in love all over again with movies. We had this one class that we truly loved. It was called Cinema 466. And it was taught by Arthur Knight, who was a British, very famous historian and critic. And he would bring these people down from Hollywood with their new movies. And so we'd get to sit in the theater and watch these movies that hadn't even been released yet. And then they would discuss them. Now, the great part about 466 and Arthur Knight was, while we're watching the movies, he's taking all these filmmakers and all these people out to dinner, and they're getting drunk. And it was always a, a, you know, a, a contest, contest to see who was going to be drunker by the time the discussion started. And I have to say, Arthur Knight usually won hands down. <laughs> One time, Clint Eastwood showed up to show one of his films, and I can't remember what it was, but my friend Will, who was this huge Clint Eastwood fan, he's up in the booth, and Clint comes up into the booth to look and to see where they are in the film, and Will is like this huge, huge fan, and he is absolutely speechless. He can't even say hello. I think at this point he didn't even remember his name. Uh, Will wrote the book, Your Screenplay Sucks, 100 Ways to Make It Great, and I've known Will for 40 years, and I have never seen him speechless. But Clint Eastwood scared the hell out of him. Where am I? I know. You know, I wrote all this shit down so I wouldn't forget. I'm going to make something up. <laughs> That's right. I wanted it more. I still do. That's the problem with all this stuff. I'm still in love with movies. And I'm still in love with making films. And no, I haven't had enough wine yet. But I'll get there. <clears throat> when it finally came time to graduate, and I was lucky because I became a teaching assistant, so they paid for my school. Um, and when I graduated, I think I told you guys before about my very first movie down in LA. I was the editor on a VD documentary. And I didn't let that stop me. Um, but I came back up to Oregon because I believed in independent filmmaking. And my first job was with McMinnville native Will Vinton. And I was the uh, editor and uh, did a lot of the sound effects work on The Adventures of Mark Twain. And I remember sitting in the editing room with Will one day, and he was, he was a great guy, I still miss him. But we're talking about film and all sorts of other stuff. And he said to me, his father used to tell everybody that my son plays around with movies. And he said that up until Will won his first Oscar. And I thought, no wonder my parents can't tell their friends what I do. They don't get it. So anyway, in 1990, Ken Burns releases The Civil War. And we all remember this because that film felt like it lasted the entire length of the fucking Civil War. Ken bores me, but that's a different story. We're not going to go there. But The Civil War comes out. And I became one of a dozen filmmakers that was selected by AFI, the American Film Institute, and CBS to do this workshop at AFI, sponsored by CBS, because they wanted to find the next Civil War, right? And so they bring, and it was an amazing film, a group of documentary filmmakers. Uh, and some of them have gone on to become quite famous, damn them. Um, but we had a month to put our ideas together, and we got to pitch to CBS. 
and we all got mentors. And there were some pretty powerful and impressive mentors in this group. Mine wasn't one of them. He was a wonderful British man who I just really, really liked. But starting at about 11 o'clock in the morning, he was hitting the red wine. And he was hitting it all day. And so we'd have these wonderful meetings and talks, and he told me so much about dealing with networks and getting a documentary series off the ground. And then he tried to tell me about life and personal stuff, and that was the shit that I wasn't going to listen to because there was a lot of red wine going on. Anyway, the day comes, and we all get to pitch to this CBS executive. And of course we're nervous, but we have our proposals down and everything. And we pitch, and out of a dozen really, really great proposals, they picked none of them. And so we got the executive after the whole meeting, and we said, dude, what's the deal? Right? Why, why are you looking for the new, uh, the new Civil War? What's going on? And then my friend Arthur said, if Ken Burns had come to you with the Civil War, would you have put the money up for it? And he said, absolutely not. We only want the Civil War or something like it because we saw the numbers. And we saw 39 people watch, 39 million people watched it. My film was 39 people watched. <laughs> 39 million people watched the Civil War. And when baseball came out, uh, over 40 million watched. And so CBS just wanted the numbers, right? And that was a really, really good education for me into how a lot of this stuff works. Luckily, the filmmakers I was with were really, really great people, and we still stay in touch. And a lot of them have done so many amazing things. So I come back to Portland to go back to work. And a lot of people have asked me throughout my career, how do you make enough money to survive and make films? Let me tell you, you're all very lucky tonight. Because I am the poster boy of bad decision making when it comes to independent filmmaking. All right? So don't be surprised if this turns into a cautionary tale. I made eight short films which all did really well, and I made money on all of them. And I talked about this yesterday, so I'm not going to go back into that. But I also made a bunch of documentaries, and then my features. I wrote and directed three features. I was also sound designing for people, working with Gus Van Zandt, Todd Haynes, all these other people. And I was directing commercials and music videos, videos and industrials, you know, whatever it took. And I was doing really, really well, and my films were doing really well on the festival circuit. And at one point, I had distributor screenings for my features in Los Angeles, New York, Toronto, and London. And they all said the same thing. We love your movies, but nobody famous is in them. And so we're not going to distribute them. And a few small distributors offered me contracts to distribute, and the numbers were not good. Right? I would not have made any money. So, as you can all tell, I am an old punk. I embraced the punk DIY ethic, and I was totally into the punk thing. No mohawks, but, you know, everything else. Anyway, so I took a page out of the punk rock handbook, and I decided to take my films out on tour, out on the road. Not easy, an easy thing to do because nobody knew had ever done it before. And so you're kind of starting from scratch. It's where the whole punk thing helped, right? Because the punks were doing shit that nobody else was doing too. They were distributing their own stuff. They were making their own records. And I love this. So I decided I'm going to do screenings, teach workshops, sell DVDs, my books, my merchandise, all of it. So step one. You might want to write this down. I got 1,000 blank DVDs from a distributor I knew, and they gave them to me on credit. And I got the boxes that go with them. And they're printable, so they're all white. 
I conned a friend of mine who was working at a Xerox place to Xerox all the labels for me at a huge discount after hours. He didn't trim them. I had to do all that myself. My biggest expense was a paper cutter. But for the next 10 days, I burned a thousand DVDs, one at a time, off of my computer. And then I took those blank printable things and plugged them into my Hewlett Packard printer. God, I need a sponsorship from them, don't I? <sighs> Put them into my Hewlett Packard printer and printed all the labels. I would have two tables full of DVDs with labels drying, right, because you didn't want to smear them. I packed every one of those DVD cases myself. Step two, I booked between six and seven weeks worth of gigs on the road at colleges, media art centers, bars. It didn't matter to me. I was just, I'm going to go out there and get this stuff done. So I had about six or seven weeks worth of gigs. And then I had to borrow a pickup truck because my car wasn't going to make this trip. And then I had to borrow a friend of mine's canopy to put onto the pickup truck so that the DVDs would be safe. And when I pulled out of Portland, I had enough money to make it to my first stop, Boulder, Colorado. And if I don't make money in Boulder, the tour is over. Hell, I don't even have enough money to get home, right? And it wasn't my truck anyway, so I was just going to leave it. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Anyway, I make it to Boulder because I have two gigs there in Boulder. This is the glamorous part of the business. This is the glamorous part. I'm sleeping on somebody's floor. I go to the University of Colorado at Boulder, and I do a workshop because they are paying me the princely sum of $75. But what they're not telling me when I go and talk to this class, to something that's 75 bucks, God, I really need this. Hopefully I can eat tonight. I have to invoice them and it's net 30. <laughs> and I do my, yeah, for, for 75 bucks, yeah. And I do my best song and dance and everything. And the instructor buys one DVD for 10 bucks because she feels sorry for me. Yeah, my life is really going places fast. But I have one other gig. And it was for a private company. I was going to talk about sound design and do this workshop for a bunch of their employees. What was this company, you ask? Well, I learned that if you live in Boulder, Colorado, and you go to film school there, when you get out, if you want to stay in the area, because it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. There are two places you can work. You can go to work for Warren Miller. Do you guys remember Warren Miller and those ski movies he would do every year? You can go to work for Warren Miller and make ski movies and the guy doesn't pay shit. They all told me this. Or you go to work for this other company that calls itself a satellite company. What this company does, you've all stayed in hotels, right? And you turn on the TV and they got all the different channels and then there's the adult channel <laughs> where they stream, I mean, come on, let's just say it, they stream porn, right? <laughs> That's what this company does. Now they assure me, we don't make the porn. Okay. We cut trailers and teasers and other things, but you know, we get the porn from other places and we send them off to the hotel rooms. Now you might think that I would have a problem with this. They promised me $800. I suddenly I have no morals, no scruples. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what a great thing pornography is in our country today. All of the people who work there are all former students at Boulder, and they're making experimental films, and they're doing documentaries, and they're doing all sorts of cool stuff. And so this workshop was a, a thank you. It was a, one of the benefits they got because, I mean, 
let's talk about this. How much sound design do you think there is in a porn film? I mean, really. There's like three or four effects. Most of them have to do with breathing, right? And that's as far, now we're going to leave that alone right now. But they all had like a million questions. And so I do this really great audio workshop. And you know, they give me a tour of the place first, and everybody's really nice and friendly, and they're all young and everything, but there's monitors everywhere, right? Making sure the satellite feed is going okay. And we go into this beautiful boardroom, this beautiful meeting room, and everybody's around this big, and there's probably 15, 20 uh, filmmakers there, and me, and they're all around the table, and they've all got their notebooks and notes. And I'm standing up here with all my stuff, but directly in my line of sight, is the biggest fucking monitor I've ever seen and is playing nothing but porn <laughs> because they cannot stop this. They want to make sure that everything is going okay. So I'm trying to talk to all of these people who are looking at me <laughs> about audio and taking questions and I'm doing it like this. <laughs> Because every now and again, I'd have to look up and would think, how the hell did they do that? But you gotta look cool, right? You gotta, this is no big deal. <laughs> Define tasteful. <laughs> We finish up after two hours. They hand me my check. I don't have to net 30 then. And all the people that are there are, start, are buying my DVDs and they're buying my stuff like crazy and I make a few hundred bucks off of that. I get this really wonderful lunch and these people are great. I mean, they're, they're all students, they're all just like us, right? So I have this wonderful time Still trying to figure out how a couple of positions happened, but that's... <clears throat> but I made money, which means that the tour goes on. And the very first thing I did is I drove to the post office and took the check and all but $200 cash of the money that I made, and I sent it home to where I did not have access to it. Because this is all... This is all pre-debit cards and all that other crap, right? Everything's cash. But I sent it all home, so I had enough money for probably the next three or four days for gas and food. Because I know at this point that I cannot take a day off. Every workshop I do, every screening I do, every lecture I give, I have to bring my A game. I have to do the best I can so that hopefully people will buy my stuff and the tour can continue. And that is how I modeled my tours, my business, all of it. I rarely kept money in my pockets. I would always send it home or someplace where I couldn't get it. So I'd have to be the best that I could be. I couldn't take any days off. I toured for seven years two months at a time in the fall, six weeks at a time in the spring. Me and my dog, Moses, who was a 120 pound chocolate lab, right? I bought a van, I put 230,000 miles on my Ford Freestar. Even my mechanic says that thing should still not exist. It's sitting right over here. You can't kill that thing. But I made money on that tour, and I made money on every tour after that, too. But the other thing is I met amazing people. I met amazing filmmakers. Uh, I saw beautiful, beautiful things. I drank moonshine with a bunch of good old boys, hung out at Hank Williams' grave at midnight. Um, you know, just a lot, of, a lot of crazy stuff. But it was incredible. And I walked away with, like I say, lots of good friends and an email list to fucking die for. And those people still stick with me and they still send me emails. The only really bad problem I ever had was, is anybody here from Iowa? Oh shit, dude. 
What is it about the state cops in Iowa? Three times over three years in the same place, almost to the day, I get pulled over by the Iowa State Police. In the same place, on the highway. And you know why they pull me over? My windows are too dark. We know why they're really pulling me over, right? I look like Jerry Garcia. <laughs> and they think the van is probably full of drugs, or at least guitar parts. They never could give me a ticket because my car's not registered there. But every, finally, after the fourth year, I would drive two hours out of the way to avoid Iowa. I have wonderful friends from Iowa. They're really, really nice. Fuck those cops. <laughs> and oddly enough, knowing me and knowing, you know, they're not the only cops I had problems with on the road. <laughs> Go figure. But one of the things I get asked all the time by other filmmakers is, is are you successful? And I always say, define success. I am not rich, I do not live in a big house, and I don't have a cool car. Wait a minute, I still have a cool car. Because you know that 70 Land Cruiser? Yeah, 40 years later, I'm still driving that fucker. Yeah. yeah, it's older than some of the people I've dated. I'm not going there. But the other thing is, I have been able to follow my passion for 40 years. I've worked on a lot of great films, and I think I've made some pretty good ones myself. I have traveled, met, and worked with amazing people, and had amazing and great adventures. I gotta stop saying amazing. I am still standing, and I intend to do so for quite a while. I want all of you here to be successful like I've been. Well, hopefully more successful. And stay away from the porn places. <laughs> But I want you to all be successful, whatever that means to you. Now, because this is a keynote, I have to do some quotes, right? So you guys think I'm smart. So one of the quotes I want to tell you right now, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. That is such bullshit. <laughs> I hate that. Because I love what I do. And I've worked my fucking ass off. <laughs> and I continue to do it because I love what I do. So get rid of these quotes. Oh, don't worry, we're gonna get to some more. <laughs> One of the great things about working in the arts is that you never learn everything. In my opinion, you never become great at what you do, because every time you complete a project, be it a film, a book, or whatever, and I write book, books too, you always raise the bar on yourself. And the next one has to be better. And as artists, we're always trying to get better. Most of us anyway, we're not gonna talk about Michael Bay. <laughs> All right, so this comes to the part of the keynote where I get to pass on my knowledge to you. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. What if I should take off this nice coat? <laughs> Show off my tattoos. Okay, number one. Don't have a plan B for your career. When you tell yourself, if this doesn't work out, I can always do, you know, fill in the blank. If you have a safety valve, you can use when things get really tough, and they will, you'll use it. Don't. If you want something bad enough, you'll find a way to make it work. Number two, never fear the word no. Once again, if you want something, you'll figure out how to make it happen. Side note, fear the word maybe. We all know that that really means no. It's just going to take a while to get there, right? I hate that fucking word. 
Number three, never be afraid to fail. It's amazing what you learn in failure. And in my mind, it makes you a better artist ultimately when you fail. Four, don't take criticisms of your work personally. Develop a thick skin. Most of you are good people, I believe. Don't know you all. Maybe some of you are shits. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to judge. But remember, you have created something that someone else doesn't like. You're still a good person. And maybe them not liking something that you've created says more about them than it does about you. And if you're not careful, I'll tell you about a screening I had in Chicago where, for the first comment, I looked at the kindly grandfatherly guy with his hand up and went, oh, this is going to be good. He ripped me a new asshole. He hated the movie. In front of the entire audience. You know, you want to say, okay, next. Number five, work together. Make new friends and contacts at film festivals and support each other. Help each other in any way you can. Here's my favorite good filmmaking quote. We must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we shall hang separately. Noted filmmaker Benjamin Franklin, who was kind of an electricity freak too. <laughs> hey, come on, I got that off the internet. It's gotta be right, right? <sighs> he, he also made a really good live at Budokan record, but that's different, okay. Number six, God, how many are there? Number six, take a chance. Get out of your comfort zone. Good things happen when you get out of your comfort zone. And remember, if good things don't happen, hopefully you'll end up with a pretty good story about it. Seven, always have a current passport because you never know what may be out on the horizon. And here's a little known fact for you, because I used to teach film history. Do you know why the filmmaking business ended up in Los Angeles as compared to New York? Because it was really close to Mexico, and most of the people in the film business were unworthy, un they were screwing people right and left even back then, and they'd sneak across the border because there was no extradition thing with the United States. So that's why the film business is, is such the honorable thing it is today. <laughs> So I guess number eight should be live close to Mexico, right? Eight, never take what we do for granted. We are lucky to get to follow our passion. Number nine, oh God, it's a really good quote. Heed the words of noted philosopher and NBA legend Charles Barkley. Credit cards exist to keep poor people poor. Keep your overhead low. Don't charge stuff on credit cards. It's only going to make it so you can't, you can't turn down work because you've got to pay the bills. Ten, surround yourselves with people who support and believe in you. When someone tells you you're no Ava DuVernay or Gus Van Zandt or Quentin Tarantino, remember, somebody probably said the same fucking thing to them. Number 11, if there is a story you have to tell, tell it. Don't wait until the time is perfect. There will never be the perfect time. It's kind of like getting married and having a kid, right? You have to do it now. If you wait until it's all perfect, it probably will never happen. Do it now. Okay, and the high point of all this is the last page. Number 12, always have bail money. This should be self-explanatory. <laughs> yeah. Take cash. And finally, for all of this stuff, I want you to remember the words of Hunter S. Thompson. When the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. So by all means, be weird. I look forward to hearing about all of your successes in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. I promise.
promise there will be more time for networking. I promise. We're not out of here till 9. I'll be quick. But everybody who wins an award has got to get recognized. You guys did a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. All right. If you haven't seen him yet, this is my dog, Cole. He will eat all the food you're willing to give him. He's a great dog. Dog, yes, dog. Woohoo! Yes. As, that's, he's, he's the official film mascot. As you can see over here, we have one super filthy animal and a mutt. <laughs> this is my brother, Scott. Uh, please thank him for running the slideshow that you guys all get to watch. Yep. Okay. Nice and quiet. I like it. Okay. So you guys probably have heard, but we watched a lot of movies this year. Ten blocks with 108 official selections to choose from, right? From those 108 selections and ten blocks, the awards are for... Best Animated Film, Best Documentary, Best Environmental Film, Best Native American Film, the Best College Student Film, which we've already given out, the Best Suspense, Horror, or Sci-Fi Film, the Best Comedy, the Best Drama, and the Best Experimental or Slightly Strange Film. Then following that, a couple of personal awards, along with the Best Local Made Film, and the awards for First Time Filmmaker and the Grand Jury Award. Yay! In the interest of continuing the festivities, and we only have this space until nine, I'm going to, call, I'm going to go through the list of nominees, the winners. When we call the winner, come on up. Nancy is going... Nancy is going... Vanna, Vanna is going to give you your plaque, your, uh, your trophy, and then head on over here again to the red carpet, step and repeat to get your official picture taken. All right, without further ado, and because, well, really no one has ever said, gosh, that award show was too short. <laughs> <laughs> the best, <laughs> the nominees for best local production are Mac and Lewis, Prison Blues, and The Rise of Whore Betsy. The winner is Simon King for The Rise of Whore Betsy. Simon, come on up here, buddy. <laughs> Congratulations, man. Great job. Yep, great job. category had its name changed in recent years to recognize one of the world's pioneers in animation from our very own Portland, Oregon, but if memory serves, he was actually born in McMinnville, Oregon. Yeah. Nominees for the Will Vinton Award for the Best Animated Short are Young and Restless, Mia, There You Are, and To the Future with Love. And the Will Vinton Award goes to Mia, who is not, not present here tonight, so the award will be shit. Tough to do the step and repeat. That would be news to me. Our next award, in partnership with Zero Waste McMinnville, goes to the Best Environmental Film. And the nominees are Painting by Numbers, Where They Drag the Boats, 
and Willow and Claude. And the winner is Willow and Claude Emma Hunkinson. Come on up if you're here. Apparently also not here. That's too bad. Go figure. Next, in partnership with the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, the nominees for the Best Native American Short are My First Native American Boyfriend and The People's Newspaper. This was really tough for the judges, and the voting was neck and neck. But congratulations, Eleanor Hamlin, for The People's Newspaper. Yes, good job. So we're going to switch to narrative. So she's playing around like I have not. <laughs> so switching to narrative content, just for a minute or two here, the nominees for the best suspense, horror, and sci-fi are Human Trash, Relicit, and She Picked Me. And the award for Best Horror Sci-Fi Suspense goes to Jason Wilkinson for She Picked Me! Congratulations, buddy. It has been a... Oh, man. It's been really hard knowing this for four days and not telling him. I've had to keep... it. In every, in every encounter, I've had to be like, nope, don't say congratulations yet. Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. He doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is why the MC doesn't really want to know until the day of, because then they got to be the guy who pulls everything in. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we have the nominees for Best Documentary. And I'll admit, I do not know how Thunder Harvest did not make it in this category. For those of you that saw Thunder Harvest, that would be the farting documentary. <laughs> I gotta, uh, gotta give uh, a little bit of ribbing to my buddy Jason Rosenblatt. That was his project, so I feel uh, justified in taking a shot at him. <laughs> He's also not here. <laughs> Can't defend himself. So, the nominees for Best Documentary are Red Tail. Oh, sorry, Rap Tail. The Black Stonefly and Whitney's Giant Ass Cinnamon Rolls. <laughs> and the winner for Best Documentary goes to Red Tail. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, goes to Rat Tail. Chad, come on up. <laughs> I don't think he's here. He's So, as all of you know, filmmaking often encourages, if not demands, risk-taking and bold maneuvers. And some of you have taken this to about the nth degree, bringing out uh, the best experimental slash a bit strange vibes. And the nominees are Melanin Vibes, Nakusa, and The Call of Water. And the award for Best Experimental or Slightly Strange Film goes to Nakusa! Yay! Yep. Oh no! Don't worry, they're well made. No one saw that. No, no evidence of. Yeah, great. Looks great. <laughs> All right. Totally. 
So back to our narrative content. Uh, the best drama nominees for this year, counting <laughs> Miracle Baby, <laughs> Mother Madam, <laughs> and Ser B. Yes. Yes. And the winner, who I believe is not here, Molly Kane for Sir B. Yes. No problem. So for any of you who've been living under a rock for the last couple of years, and really most of us have because of worldly events, uh, it's given us a pretty good uh, bit of ammunition for comedy shorts this year. And my goodness, they were great. I sat through that block and just about couldn't take it. So uh, it's no wonder that this year was so incredible. This year's nominees for Best Comedy Short are Naval Gazers. <laughs> Squish and the Acolyte with the award going to Xavier Seron for Squish. I, again, I don't think he's here. Just put it all on my tab. I'll give you a card for all the shipping later. <laughs> Oh wait, didn't Kelly just say don't have a credit card? Oh yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna be an economist for like 30 seconds. He said don't use credit cards for credit. Don't use them for credit, use them for convenience, okay? That's what they're good for, that's it. <clears throat> a lot of us were noobs a long time ago. I remember about 10 years ago, I went through the filmmaking process for the first time, and my first thought was, gosh, that movie was 90 minutes. They might have spent like a whole six hours making that because they probably had to take more than one shot at each thing, right? Holy crap, was I freaking wrong, man. This is about the most painful endeavor that anybody would undertake if they didn't absolutely know this is what they were made for. I tell people all the time, Unless you know this is what you want to do, go do something else, anything else that will make you happy. Because in the end, if you don't think this is the only thing for you, uh, you'd be better served doing something else. So this next award goes to the people that took a deep look within themselves and said, this is the path for me. The award for the best first time filmmaker. The nominees are Catherine Bourne Taylor for Ships in the Night. Okay, uh, Alexa, Alexa Lautenschlager for Transcending Duality, and, oh, did it go, <laughs> right, okay, and uh, Rhett Bowers for Jamaica, and the winner for the best first time filmmaker is Rhett Bowers for Jamaica, woohoo! the Academy, my mom, my dad, and my wife. What a great list. So complimenting our best local film, we also award the best Oregon filmmaker every single year. And the three nominees are Court Ross for Again and Again, Jamee Lowe Roberts, for Being Me in the Current America, and John Irvine for Common Monster, uh, sorry, John Irvine for Common Monsters, and Faith E. Briggs for Camp Yoshi.
And the winner for Best Oregon Filmmaker this year is Camp Yoshi, Faith E. Briggs. Come on down if you are here. No. Yep, that's it. Last but not least, because we do these in no particular order, the Grand Jury Award. Oh, wait, maybe we do do them in some kind of order. Who would have thought? Eagles, directed by Christy Guevara Flanagan. Dinner for Two, directed by Joe LaBianco. <laughs> Feeling Through, directed by Doug Rowland. And West Winds, directed by Matthew Thomas Ross. And the Grand Jury Award goes to Doug Rowland for Feeling Through. Come on down, Doug. <laughs>